place. So anybody at all, just speak up and say, do you know why it says Costa Rica Pura Vida on my slide? So that's the national slogan, Pura Vida. Literally, it means pure life, but really it means cool. <laughs> just let me just make sure people can still hear me. Yes, John. Uh, yeah. Great. Will you please uh, um, put your slides in presentation mode? Oh, please? yes. Thank you. Oops, almost there. There we go. Um, so yeah, it's the national slogan. It means cool. So if it, somebody asks you how you are, you say Pura Vida. You say, how'd you like the, the show? Pura Vida. Pura, everything's Pura Vida in Costa Rica. And the other thing, I was glad you had, had the word Tico on the uh, slideshow that you showed, because I see that I put, the, I put it there as my title. So any, anybody know what Tico means or why there's the word Tico? So how about anybody speaks Spanish who has access to a microphone and can talk out loud and say, how would you say a little bit in Spanish? Anybody know? Un poco. Un poco. How about a very little bit? Poquito. And how do you say an extremely little bit? Po poquitico, right? Poquitito, oh, poquitito. Right. But the Costa Ricans say poquitico, so they got the nickname Ticos. Uh, Okay, so I'm gonna go way back before Costa Rica ever existed. Uh, where Costa Rica is now, it was just ocean and there were some volcanic islands. And about a million and a half years ago, then that, that the whole isthmus uh, there filled in. Uh, and so all of, all of Central America, the land mass was formed about uh, a million and a half years ago. So it's one of the newer land masses on the earth. One of the key features of Costa Rica is the mountains. It really isolates Costa Rica, the Central Valley, especially of Costa Rica, this area right here. It really isolates it from the rest of the world. Um, and uh, you'll see, you'll hear an example about that in a minute. And most of the people, about half the population or more than half the population lives in the Central Valley of Costa Rica right, right here, which is just a wonderful climate, one of the best in the world. Almost nobody has heating or air conditioning because you don't need it. It's just a lovely day almost every day. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the first people uh, in, uh, in this area. Uh, and so there were two groups of people, which were uh, the Mayans, which uh, was an influence down from Mexico and Northern Central America, all the way down into this part, this little Northwestern part of Costa Rica, which is called Guanacaste, that's the province of Guanacaste. And then from South America, there were the Chibcha people, and though those people traveled up or people who were descended from them or related to them or spoke the same language uh, moved up this way. So, you, but you'll see the mountains were a barrier. And so actually there, there was a mix of cultures uh, in Costa Rica all the way from the beginning of when there were people there. So one of the first things that you'll, one of the great things that you'll see in Costa Rica if you go and you wanna to go to this place is called Guayabo. This is the largest, excavated archeological site in the country that's open to the public. Uh, and this is one of the early settlements of people who lived uh, in this area in, in Costa Rica. It's on the, on the, it's like in the foothills of the um, Turialba volcano. So then there was the era of colonization. Uh, it was uh, people from Spain who colonized this part of the world. Uh, and they divided up uh, the, you know, the Spanish empire into several different, what they called audiencias. We would say like an audience, but that's probably not the correct translation uh, of the word for our purposes, but it's a part of, you know, of the governmental structure of Spain in the colonies uh, in the Americas. And so they had several different audiencias and Costa Rica was a part of the audiencia of Guatemala, which as you'll see ends here because actually Panama, which is this part, was actually part of Colombia uh, and wasn't uh, separated from Colombia until the United States government wanted to build a canal in Panama. And then they arranged for Panama to become independent from Colombia so that uh, that deal could be made. So there's something very interesting that happened in a little town of Barva, which is almost in the center of the country. It's just, as you can see, just at the Northern end of the Central Valley there. Uh, so the king of Spain owned all the land, basically from, from the very southern part of South America, Tierra del Fuego, 
all the way up into California, right? The, the king was the sole owner of all that land, except for basically Brazil, which belonged to Portugal and a couple other places. But some people in Barba got this interesting idea. They said, what if we write a really polite petition to the king and ask the king if he would give us some little plots of land so we could grow gardens. So they made this really polite petition and they sent it to the king and amazingly the king said yes well then the neighboring towns heard about it and they said well this sounds like a good deal right and so they started sending petitions and the king kept saying yes um but when when you when i say a little piece of land it's not for a garden it's not what we think about as a little piece of land for a garden it was a little farm right so it got to the point where i think there were hundreds or even thousands of people who had their own private owned farms in Costa Rica before, before it became independent. And this will be very important to remember something later. Also, all of this is important to remember because of the quiz, of course, we have this is a college event, so we have to have a quiz at the end, right? Okay, so when I talk about independence, not everybody was happy, just like in the United States, people weren't happy in the colonies about being, um, uh, you know, a col colonies of uh, England forever, Great Britain forever. Uh, and so um, there were some uprisings and rebellions in the early 1800s. And then in 1821, that's when there was actually, I, I think there's probably a misspelling in here. There was actually an act of independence uh, for Guatemala, which included part of Mexico, southern part of Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua and Costa Rica. But it took a month for somebody to get from Guatemala to the capital city in Costa Rica to tell them they were independent. And it's partly because of this mountainous environment around the, um, you know, around San Jose, Costa Rica. Uh, so there's that uh, interesting tidbit there. Now, one of the main crops of uh, Costa Rica back then and still today is coffee. Uh, this, this, by the way, this five cologne notes, a cologne is the Costa Rican concert, uh, currency named after uh, Christopher Columbus or Cristobal Colon. Uh, and you'll see people picking coffee and, and putting coffee in bushels and then taking that all in sacks and everything down to the ships, uh, which were in Limon, which is actually where uh, Columbus landed, though this was several hundred years later. Uh, but their coffee got to be a very big industry. Uh, and there got to be some really big, rich coffee barons, especially when, so uh, they started exporting coffee in 1820, and then they got uh, independence in 1821. So there was a big land grab. All these coffee farmers were like grabbing up all the land they could. And this happened in lots of countries in the area. Uh, but unlike other countries, well, let me just tell you some things that happened in some of the other countries. El Salvador, for example, um, is uh, there, it's one of the things that's sort of famous there is the 14 families. There's basically at least a few decades ago, 14 families that still controlled virtually all of the economy of El Salvador, right? And that's what the coffee barons in Costa Rica wanted to do, but there was a problem. And the problem for them was that all these people in Barva and all these other towns who had petitioned the king had gotten these small land hold, holdings of, and a lot of them were growing coffee. So when the coffee barons wanted to control the price, the people in all, all these other little farmers, coffee farmers said, no, 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 you're not controlling the price. We have a say because we're a big part of the production, right? Some other things that the coffee barons tried to do once Costa Rica was independent, they wanted to make the government pay for schools just for the rich kids. But the people in Barva and other places, no, no, the schools have to be for everybody. And they wanted to have the public hospitals and clinics be just for the rich people. But all these other small landowners, no, 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 we're not going for that. And so they really had basically a rural middle class, which was very unusual uh, for this region of the world. Um, and so that's why countries like El Salvador only had a few families controlling everything. But in Costa Rica, it was much more democratic because much more people owned uh, the, um, you know, owned the uh, production at that time. This five cologne note, which is now worth, I think, about a fraction of a penny 
uh, in terms of real value. It's a collector's item though. Uh, this is actually a mural that's painted, I think on the, if I remember correctly, on the ceiling uh, of the National Theater in Costa Rica. And I'll just tell you, there's a couple of things a little out of place here. One of them is the bananas. I mean, there were bananas, but they weren't shipping them back then. They weren't shipping them in the early 1820s. They didn't ship them till the late, uh, the latter half of the 1800s. And the other thing is, those are not typical clothes from Costa Rica. The person who painted this painting was French. So he painted French peasant clothes rather than what you know farm uh, workers uh, would wear in Costa Rica. Okay, another very important thing that happened uh, in the mid 1800s, I think it was in the 1850s, uh, there was a fellow named William Walker. Uh, interesting, because he used to live in Sacramento. He was a journalist. He, the guy was, I think he was like 30 something when he died. He was a doctor, a lawyer, and a journalist. And as you'll see in just a moment, he was also a mercenary. So what he did was in the 1850s, you know, there was this getting to be more and more tension between the North and the South uh, in the United States. Uh, and you know, the, the South obviously was, obviously was supporting slavery and the North was opposed. Uh, and so he had this idea. He went to the Confederate government and he said, or the Confederate, the, the, not, there, I don't know if there was a Confederate government yet, but the, you know, the, the Southern states. And he said, here's what you do, give me money and I will hire a bunch of mercenaries and we're gonna go and we're gonna conquer the countries in Central America. And then we're gonna make them Southern states and they're all gonna vote for, um, for slavery, right? And then you'll, you'll have more votes and then you'll win, right? Uh, so that's what he did. And he invaded Nicaragua. Uh, he actually conquered Nicaragua. Uh, and then he declared, and then he declared himself king of Nicaragua. Um, and then he decided it was time to go conquer uh, Costa Rica. So his mercenary army invaded Costa Rica. Costa Rica really didn't have much of an army, but they, you know, they're, you know, like many countries, they're proud people, they want to defend their country. And they went up to fight in the northern, well, northwest province of Guanacaste, which I showed you on the map. They went up to fight against William Walker's mercenaries. Well, fortunately for them, the, either the nephew of the, I can't remember if it's the nephew of the general or the uncle of the general of the Costa Rican army had grown up in this great big house that the, the, the you know, these mercenaries were holed up in uh, there in Costa Rica. And so they knew exactly the lay of the land and they came in at night, very quiet. They put artillery and the posted guns and all this stuff all around it. And the morning there was a very short battle and they drove the mercenaries out of Costa Rica. So they went back to their base in Rivas, Nicaragua and then they said, well, Costa Rican said, well, just kicking them out of here isn't good enough because then they just come back. So we got to go kick them out everywhere, right? So they went up to Rivas and they had, they were, the mercenaries were staying in a hotel and they laid siege to the hotel. It was a big fight. Lots of people died on both sides. And then the, what happened next, it depends on who you ask. Because my understanding is if you ask somebody in Nicaragua, they'll say that a Nicaraguan teacher burned down the hotel. But if you ask a Costa Rican, they'll say, no, 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 wasn't anybody like that. It was somebody, it was a Costa Rican named Juan Santa Maria. And we know that because his mother got a military pension. He died, by the way, uh, in, in, this, in the process. And uh, his mother got a military pension. The weird thing was he wasn't a member of the Costa Rican military. So the theory was that he was a member of the military band. And so when they asked for a volunteer to burn down the building, he said, yes, and went and did it and it died. But they figured, well, even if he wasn't in the military, the least we can do is give his mother a military pension. Okay, so I mentioned about, uh, you know, the coffee. And one of the things that's really, Costa Rica is really famous for is the ox cart. You can see this is an incredibly colorful ox cart. Many of them are like this. Uh, though my understanding is that the, um, the farmers did not choose the ox carts based on their physical beauty. They chose them based on the sound that the wheel made as it was rolling, or the wheels made as they were rolling on the roads because they had to listen to that sound all day. So if the, we the wheels were nice and circular, I guess they liked that sound better. Okay, but anyway, it's important to know about the ox cart because of what happened next. The coffee barons, okay, so the coffee barons 
really wanted to get a railroad because they were taking all their coffee down from the mountains in ox carts, very inefficient, very expensive. And so they hired one company to try to build a railroad and they, you know, cause I told you about all the mountains, right? They, I, they hired one company to build a railroad and they couldn't, they, they couldn't do it. I think they might've hired another company. So they finally hired this guy named Minor Keith and Minor Keith had been building railroads in the United States and I think in other places. He said, oh yeah, I'll build your railroad. You just have to give me the right of way, all the land on both sides of the railroad, but for miles in both directions, right? And all the other unused land in the country, under unused federal land in the country, anything that's not like a national park or something, you gotta give me all that. And they said, okay, okay, we'll do that, right? So he built the railroad and he's bringing down all the railroad equipment and ships from the United States. And he's thinking, you know, this is not a very good business deal taking these empty ships back up. I need to go find some stuff to put in the ship so I can sell. Uh, and so he tried one thing and another thing and he wasn't really making much headway. And then one time he said, you know what? I'm gonna just, you know, these green, these stems of all these green things, these banana things, you know, there's like a hundred of them on a stem. I'm gonna just put a bunch of those stems up, take them up to New York, see if anybody wants to buy them. People went crazy in New York. They had never seen bananas before. And they thought, wow, it's so convenient. You just peel it and you eat it. And so he started what was called the United Fruit. I'm sorry, he started the New York Fruit Company. There was also uh, around the same time, uh, the Boston Fruit Company. And the two of them then merged in 1899 to become the United Fruit Company, which some of you may know is both famous and infamous in various ways. Um, it then became the, uh, I think in the 70s, around the 70s, something like that, 1970s, it became the United Brands, and then it became Chiquita Brands International, which is the company that I work for uh, in Costa Rica. It was the largest uh, exporter of bananas in the world. It controlled 90%. In the early 1900s, it controlled 90% of the world export market for bananas. They had one of the best marketing uh, they had one of the best marketing departments ever. You know, they had the Miss Chiquita and they had the, the song about Chiquita bananas uh, and they, they had a tremendous uh, effect on the banana market. Okay, so Costa Rica was, had been a very democratic country uh, almost the entire time since it was founded in, the 18, in 1820. Um, and they had democratic elections and they had a peaceful transfer of power. But then in 1948, uh, there was another democratic election and the incumbent party won. I'm sorry, the incumbent party lost. And they said, we're not leaving. <laughs> we lost the election, but we're not leaving. That sound familiar? Um, and then, uh, but the, the winning party said, well, no, you, you lost, you have to leave. And the government said, the incumbent party said, no, no, we're not leaving, leaving. And the military says we're not leaving. And the winning party said, no, you're leaving. And the people say you're leaving. And there was a civil war between the people and the military. And the people beat the military in three weeks. Not even a lot of people died. Um, and then the, the, the new president, Pepe Figueres here, the first thing he did was to abolish the military. So he went to this fort right in downtown San Jose, uh, right by where the legislature is. And the first thing he did was he said, military is abolished, you're all fired, you can go pick coffee or whatever you wanna do. And he symbolically you know, knocked down part of the wall of the fort. Okay, so um, I've been talking a lot. And uh, let me just stop for a minute and see if anybody has questions about the history of Costa Rica. And I'm gonna talk about some other things about Costa Rica. Uh, couldn't hear. Was that a question? No, that was not a question. I was okay. telling the, the okay. everybody to unmute yourself if you have a question and raise your hand if you have a question to bring the mic to you. Okay, well, I'll ask for questions again later. So one of the things that's really important to know is about Costa Rica is that it has what, what are referred to as microclimates. Um, you know, like for example, in Fresno, 
you know, basically hot and dry, right? Sacramento, basically hot and dry. But Costa Rica, it's like, you know, you can just drive a couple of miles and the climate can change significantly. So there are these life zones. And one of them, I mentioned before, this area of Guanacaste in the Northwest part, um, this is one of the largest areas of tropical dry forest that are left in the world. Almost all the, because there's all that hardwood, like mahogany and teak and all that kind of stuff uh, that grows really well in that kind of forest. And it's almost all gone. Uh, there's also lots of rainforest, lots and lots of rainforest in Costa Rica. And there's even a part of Costa Rica, it might be here, I don't know where it is exactly, but somewhere around in here, there's a cloud forest, it's otherwise known as a moist forest, uh, but there's a cloud forest. So there's very, very different uh, life zones or microclimates throughout uh, Costa Rica. But so it's, and by the way, the weather in the tropics is controlled almost entirely by altitude. So if you're at low-lying areas at the beach or in low-lying areas here, like in the Caribbean plain, it's almost always hot. If you're way up in the mountains, there are some mountains up here that get quite cold. Don't know if there's ever been snow. People say there has, but could have been frost, not sure. Um, but at any rate, uh, those get quite cool. But like I say, almost everybody lives in the Central Valley. More than half, I think, of the population lives in the Central Valley where it's basically lovely every day. <laughs> okay. So I want to talk to you about some of the major cities. San Jose is the capital and it is by far the major city. Uh, I think there's two million people in, in San Jose. Um, and then uh, some of these other early cities, big early cities, Alajuela, where the airport is. The airport, by the way, is named after Juan Santa Maria, the person who Costa Rica claims torched the hotel where those merc mercenaries were in uh, Nicaragua. Um, Heredia is another town. By the way, it's interesting because Alajuela and San Jose were always like the politically progressive cities, whereas Heredia and Cartago were always the politically more conservative cities. Um, so Heredia is, the main thing Heredia is known for besides the, their national university is that people in Heredia walk in the middle of the street. Uh, Cartago is known because they have this basilica, this great big church where uh, this girl uh, is reported that she found this rock at a spring and it looked like the Virgin Mary and she took her to the church and all this stuff happened. And anyway, so they built this big shrine there and every year over a million people walk to Cartago on August the 2nd, which is the day that she found this rock. I'll be telling you about Turialba a little later, my favorite place. And then the other a few major cities, San Isidro is known for ox carts. They have this big ox cart parade. Uh, Liberia, there's the other international airport in Liberia, uh, which is, as I said, in the Northwest. And if people want to go to the beach, that's usually where they fly to. Uh, Punta Arenas was, was like one of the first big uh, beach towns. And then, as I mentioned before, Limon is where uh, Columbus landed. Actually, he docked on a tiny little island, almost swimming distance from the coast. Uh, and then came ashore. Uh, and there's something, oh, there's something, by, by the way, it's very important uh, that I didn't mention when I talked about abolishing the military. Um, so uh, Pepe Figueres didn't just abolish the military. He also, ab abolished, he also abolished apartheid in 1948 in Costa Rica. The thing is that when Minor Key started building the railroad, he brought uh, workers in from Jamaica. I think partly because they spoke English. He brought them into Limon and they were the main people who built the railroad. And then, you know, the idea was that when they got done building the railroad, they would go back to Jamaica and they would have some money and that would be a good thing, right? But then he, and then he developed all those banana farms and hired the same people to go develop the, the, the banana farms and work in the banana farms. Um, but Costa Rica had a law that, uh, descendants of Jamaicans, Black people in Costa Rica, could not spend the night, they could not live in or spend the night in San Jose. So basically, they all lived in the province of Limon. The farthest east they were allowed to go overnight was to Turialba. That was where the, the train, by the way, went from San Jose through Turialba down to Limon. The farthest um, uh, west they could spend the night was in Turialba because that's where the closest hospital was. So if they had to go to the hospital, they could spend the night there. So again, Pepe Figueres uh, 
eliminated apartheid in 1948, and he also gave women the vote in 1948. So the country dramatically changed overnight uh, in Costa Rica. Okay. Well, I just had little arrows here to show you the other major cities. I want to tell you a little, about, a little bit about some of the industries in Costa Rica. Um, so agriculture was traditionally the biggest industry, but now the biggest industry is services. Uh, lots of companies have their, uh, and for, let, let's take, for example, Procter & Gamble, huge consumer products company headquartered in Cincinnati, Ohio, right across from the Chiquita building where I used to work. And uh, at any rate, but they decided that they were going to run their entire Western Hemisphere operations out of Costa Rica. So because there's no military, they took all that money from the military and they put it into healthcare and education. So there's a there's a healthy population, an educated population, a stable government. There's no, it's be very hard to have a coup. There's hardly any guns. There's no military, right? Um, and so the service sector, sector has grown dramatically. So that's now the largest sector. Uh, then there's, as I said, about a quarter of, the, of it is agriculture and about a quarter of it is manufacturing. Uh, and a big part of that manufacturing is electronics because Intel built a plant there and immediately became 5% of the whole gross domestic product of the country. So five of that 25%, I think, is, is Intel. And then you'll see there's some other uh, sectors. Um, tourism is also a significant part of the economy, 6%. So just going to talk a little bit about tourism. Lovely places to go in Costa Rica. This is the Arenal volcano. Unfortunately, it stopped. It used to be exploding putting out lava 24 hours a day. Incredible show when there was no clouds. Unfortunately, it stopped doing that. I don't know if it'll start up, but for now it's stopped. Um, incredible beaches. Uh, this is the Manuel Antonio beach. There's actually three beaches in the An Manuel Antonio National Park. Um, they're the first beach the public can go to, the second beach you walk across after you get into the National Park. They're, they're sort of just sort of straight beaches, right? And then you come down here and you get to a beach that has three different names. Playa Blanca, because the sand is so white. Uh, Playa Manuel Antonio, because it's, you know, it's Manuel Antonio Park. And Playa Tres, because it's the third beach you get to. But it's just lovely. Uh, you got white-faced monkeys trying to steal your food all the time. You can take a great walk out onto this peninsula here between the two beaches. Uh, and then you got the sandy part that you can go swim in, just lapping little waves, very shallow, you might be able to see here. And then the rocky part where you can go and see like, you know, uh, sea stars and things like that. And as I mentioned, rainforests, cloud forests, incredible vegetation, uh, you know, zip lining and, you know, tram tours, you know, canopy tours are very, very popular uh, in Costa Rica. And then some more uh, things I want to share with you, and I'll take some questions uh, again. So typical food. Uh, so one of the most typical foods is what's called gallo pinto. It's a mixture of rice and beans with a special sauce. It's sort of like steak sauce. Uh, the favorite one is lisano, uh, but there's also another one called, oh God, I forgot the other one. But lisano is the favorite one. So it's basically rice and beans mixed together with this lisano steak-like sauce. And then there's what's called a casado. And so Costa Ricans eat gallo pinto for breakfast almost every day. And they eat a casado for lunch and dinner almost every single day. And what's a casado? It's a casado is rice and beans. Usually there's some kind of meat, could be steak, chicken, or fish. Uh, fish more if you're living near the coast, but you know, could be anyway. Uh, and then uh, there's usually some plantains, fried plantains, and there might be some avocado. And um, so there's a couple of theories about, so gallo pinto, it's like gallo is a rooster and pinto is like a pinto pony, like a pony like with spots. So you can see it's sort of like spotted, right? And uh, the casado, there's two theories about why it's called the casado. One is because you, casado means married or a married man. Uh, and so there's different foods married on the plate. That might be why it's called a casado. The other thing is that's that's what the casada, the wife, mar cooked for her casado, her husband, every single day is the casado. 
And I just want to tell, tell you, since this is a university context, I have to tell you a university story. So one time there was a university in Costa Rica <laughs> that was having an international festival. Great fun, right? And because San Jose is the capital city, there's all these embassies. Those, so the students were all in groups and they all went to the embassies and some of them got posters and some of them got music CDs. Some of them actually got like the typical clothing from the country to wear at the booth. Some of them got recipes and made food and stuff like that. It was really, it was great fun. And of course, Costa Rica is a country. So Costa Rica had to have a booth, right? So I walk up to the Costa Rica booth and I meet the guy behind the booth. And he says to me, have you ever had Costa Rican food? I thought it was sort of a funny question since I was in Costa Rica. But anyway, I, yes, I've had Costa Rican food. And he says to me, Costa Rican food is the best food in the world. Now, I'll tell you, I think Costa Rican food is good. I like it. But I wouldn't say it's the best food in the world. And I said to him, I said, do you see that booth next to you? The Italy booth? He says, have you ever had gallo pinto? I said, have you ever had lasagna? I mean, the thing is, I think, I think everybody thinks they're the best, right? And in every way. And, you know, Costa Rica has lots of reasons to be proud. They do have good food. And like I say, he thought it was the best food in the world. So I told you about Turrialba, uh, my favorite place. I have a little tiny house there. I shouldn't call it a tiny house because you'll think it's a tiny house. It's a rustic cabin, we'll call it that. Uh, and great things available in the Turrialba area. Uh, one of them is the Turrialba volcano. It's the largest volcano in Central America. Uh, it is active. Um, uh, smoke comes out all the time now. And that actually happened. That only started happening about years ago something like that and they've had some little explosions people are concerned some people have moved off of the mountain here because they're you know they've actually evacuated the, the, the higher area here i mentioned guayabo before the largest excavated archaeological uh, uh, area that's open to the public um, and then over here is the Pacuari river best whitewater rafting in central america one of the best whitewater rivers in the world and one more thing, and that is this whole area is owned by a, a university. It's a graduate only university in tropical agriculture. It's called Katye. Uh, and they have an incredible botanical garden right, uh, right here on the edge of Turialba. Okay, so some other lovely places to go in Costa Rica, Tamarindo, that's where my late wife and I went on our, uh, on our honeymoon. Uh, this is the Rio Celeste. Yes, the water really is this color. Um, there's minerals in the water that make it this color. Uh, my, my wife and I and some others in the family, we took a hike up to this. It's a pretty long hike. I mean, some miles, some miles. And we decided, unfortunately, we decided we walk around the back of the, the thing and come back on the trail coming back. But the trail coming back only goes about halfway. So we get about halfway back and now we're like, slogging through the jungle along the river and it couldn't cross the river and um and you know it's getting dark like it was pretty pretty scary but it was lots of fun manzanillo this is on the caribbean side spectacular beaches on the caribbean side as well um uh yeah the uh, howler monkeys uh here there's howler monkeys in a lot of places but lots and lots of howler monkeys here it's incredible to hear them from from a mile or more away in the jungle Monteverde is the cloud forest I mentioned. A uh, very interesting story about Monteverde. Uh, what happened there was um, that the Quakers, and let me just check on time. How am I doing on time, folks? You're good, you can, you can go on. Okay, so Monteverde, very interesting story about Monteverde. As I mentioned, it's a cloud forest. It's basically a big mountain with a cloud forest on the top. And what happened was that after World War II, some Quakers in the eastern part of the United States, I think in Pennsylvania, decided that not only did they not want to serve in the military, which they will not do, because they're what's called a peace church, uh, but they also didn't want to pay taxes to the U.S. government anymore for all the, you know, all the war stuff that was, you know, all the all the weapons and soldiers and all that. So in when we, so this was after 1945 when the World War II ended. They were thinking about this. And in 1948, uh, uh, Costa Rica abolished the military. And they said, that sounds like a good place for us. 
and they went and bought the entire mountain. And a lot of them, I think, had been in the dairy industry, and they said, that's what we're going to do here. And what we're going to do is we're going to reserve the entire top of the mountain as a, as a cloud forest, a private reserve, so that we'll always have water that will flow in the streams downstream, and we can irrigate you know, pasture, and then we can have cows, and then we can make cheese. So Monteverdi cheese is a very big, um, a very big uh, product in Costa Rica, and Monteverde is uh, a great tourist destination. There's a path, all there's trail all the way around the top of the mountain. And you can see the, uh, the famous Quetzal bird there. And my wife and I were asking, where do we see the Quetzal bird? <laughs> Finally, somebody said, oh, so you start at the higher numbered uh, spots and you walk around the mountain until you get to the lower number ones. And they said, just go to bench two and look up, you'll see it. <laughs> and when you know it, we get to the end, we sit down, look up, there's the Quetzal bird. Manuel Antonio, I mentioned to you, so not only are there white-faced monkeys, there are also sloths. Uh, there, the word sloth in, you know, also means so, something that's very slow. They're extremely slow. They only come uh, down from the tree, I understand, once a, once a week. I uh, don't want to offend anybody, but they only come down to poop. Um, and other than that, they're just up in the tree. They only live in one kind of tree, uh, the guaru or guaruma tree because that's the only thing they eat is those leaves uh, so that's the sloth there's two kinds two-toed and three-toed don't get anywhere near a two-toed sloth because they're very aggressive but the three-toed sloths are very 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 nice tortuguero uh, this is on the crib the north end of the caribbean side uh, this is another rainforest the only way to get to tortuguero is by boat there's no road that'll get you there uh, and you come up the river and canals and streams and all around, and you actually come, you all, sort of come almost into the ocean waves at one point and go from, come from one river, coming down one river and up another. And this is one of the great places to see turtles lay their eggs. It's an amazing, amazing place. You go out at night, everybody's got like red cellophane on their flashlights to not disturb the turtles. And you can just stand there and watch the turtles dig these huge turtles, right? So you sea turtles dig big holes in the ground, lay maybe 200 eggs and then cover them all up. You can't even tell where the turtle was when they go back into the ocean. And then like a month later, all the turtles, you know, are born and they go right into the ocean and swim off. Kawita is another beach uh, along, the, uh, along the Caribbean there. Poas, you saw that in the slideshow that uh, Fresno State showed you at the beginning. This is another active volcano. Um, amazing place to see. Corcovado is in the southwest of the country. It's actually a part of the uh, volcanic chain that the Galapagos Islands are a part of. Corcovado, uh, some people say, is the most biologically diverse place on the planet. Um, and there's a national park there that you can go to that's just a spectacular place to see big cats and all kinds of uh, animals that you don't see almost anywhere else. That's the end of the slideshow. And I want to see, and I'm going to stop sharing. And I want to just see if there's any questions. We might show a video. We might have a quiz. There might be a prize. I don't know. Questions? Anybody have questions? Oh, look at that big audience. There's a whole bunch of people there now. There was only one before. Okay. Anybody have questions? I know everybody, want, everybody wants to know, when can I go? <laughs> as soon as we get this pandemic under control, then we can all go to Costa Rica. Okay, so, um, so what do you think? Do you, want, uh, do you want to see a video about Costa Rica? Do you want to do the quiz? How much time do we have? Where are we now? Uh, we can do quiz. Okay, uh, you're going to host it? Uh, yeah, I will host it. Okay, terrific. Oh, so <laughs> I see the link is there in the chat. Are we going to take like a Kahoot? Yes, Kahoot. 